start decluttering one spot and then you go to the other side of your house and start decluttering another spot and then you decide it might be the time to pull apart a closet and you end up with a whole bunch of little projects started and nothing finished. Possibly one of the biggest tips that I could give is a firm date and then work backward with a contract on hand, parachuting in and a professional to help. They feel stuck in their current circumstances because they literally can't get out from the physical and sometimes the emotional weight of the things that they've, that they've gained. The big win is that when you let go of those things from the past is that there's now room for the future. From the Zoomerplex in historic Liberty Village, The Zoomer with Marissa Lennox. Welcome to The Zoomer, I'm Marissa Lennox. Have you ever felt stressed out by a mess? Turns out clutter at home can trigger chaos in the brain. Clutter has been linked to stress, anxiety, depression, procrastination, even weight gain. That's right, extra stuff isn't just messy, it could be holding you back from living a healthier and happier life. On today's show, we discuss the benefits of decluttering your space and the best ways to tackle the problem. But before we dive in, let's tee up the topic. Have you ever wondered how many germs might be hiding in your home? <laughs> or how much stuff your house actually contains? Here are just a few numbers. Four billion, the amount of living germs the average kitchen dishcloth can contain. 40,000, the amount of dead skin cells an average person sheds per minute. 25, the number of centimeters bacteria is sprayed when you flush the toilet. 300,000, the amount of stuff the average home contains. One in four, the ratio of people who say they have a clutter problem. All right, Julie, you know, first off, when we talk about clutter, what are we talking about? Is it a pile of dishes in the sink or is this sort of disorder on a larger scale? Well, usually we like to think about clutter as things that people have not made a decision about. So there are things that are sitting around and you haven't decided if you're keeping them or letting go of them. So it's not just necessarily things you haven't gotten around to like those dirty dishes, but it's more like things that are stuck in the bottom of closets because you can't decide what to do with them or maybe stuck in the back of a cupboard because you're maybe it's sentimental and the decision's hard to make. Those are the kinds of things that we consider to be clutter. I think we can all identify with disorder causing us to feel on edge, but there's something going on in the body and the brain that is actually making that happen. There's a science to that. Jane, can you speak to that a little bit? Oh my goodness, you're putting me on the spot now. <laughs> well, when you work with your clients, I mean, you know, how does it make them feel really? I mean, what's the emotional side of clutter is really what I'm trying to get at here. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, the, the you know, the, the biggest thing for people is that they are, um, completely overwhelmed. And I think as you already alluded to, they feel weighed down by everything they own. And to Julie's point, it's a mass of unmade decisions. You know, Catherine, in your experience dealing with clients, have you seen this relationship between clutter and stress? I mean, I can tell you when I walk into a room that's disorganized, Immediately, it makes me feel a little bit anxious. How am I going to begin to deal with this? Is that something that you see in your experience and in your practice? Clearly, clearly. We deal with clients on a daily basis, helping them downsize. That's the heart of what we do. And so we see clients that are not only stressed, but they feel immobilized. Often they feel or they believe that it's better for them to move to smaller, maybe simpler accommodations, but they feel stuck in their current circumstances because they literally can't get out from the physical and sometimes the emotional weight of the things that they've, that they've gained. Mm -hmm. and, th and that weight, it is emotional. It's hard to part with those things. You know, Sushi, when we think about clutter, the opposite of clutter is to declutter. And I know when I get rid of stuff, it makes me feel good in so many ways. It's actually cathartic. So there's gotta be something going on too that triggers that sort of reaction. Um, what do you think? 
Yeah, no, and, and, and it's well said. The, some, sometimes there's a lot of projects that somebody would have started and uh, they have kept, kept that un, unfinished. And there's a lot of guilt around getting rid of it uh, just because they've started a project. It reminds them of something that happened back when. And yeah, that is definitely things that weigh them down. You know, Julie, Susha just touched on it, but the difficulty of letting go, um, you know, this obviously our audience, they're Zoomers, they've spent a lifetime accumulating things. Why is it so difficult to let go of some of that stuff? A lot of times the possessions that you have make you feel that you um, are a certain type of person or you have a certain type of job and they give you that kind of confidence. So when you start to downsize and move to a smaller place, you have to start letting go of some of these items that you associate with your identity. Like perhaps you feel you're a carpenter or you're a seamstress or you're a teacher and now you need to start letting go of all those things. And there's this fear of who am I now? But the big win is that when you let go of those things from the past is that there's now room for the future and all those wonderful things that can happen with the downside. Mm -hmm. Catherine, what do you advise your clients when they're having, you know, that difficulty letting go of some of those things that they associate with their identity that brings back memories, you know, that box full of things that could almost bring you to tears and you may be telling them you should really let go of this stuff, but they, and because there's no space for it, but they don't want to. Well, we advise them that it gets easier with practice. And so what we find is if you start with the simple things that you can disassociate from, that you gain confidence and you feel that rush of satisfaction from letting go of something small. And small things can be paperwork, it can be books, it can be things that you're not really emotionally tied to, to the same degree that you might be to things that have got deeper emotional energy to them. And so if you start with small things that are easier for you, we find that the motivation becomes self-fulfilling and all of a sudden we're struggling to keep up with people who are just throwing things left and center because they get a sense that it's doable. And we always make sure that we work at our client's pace. So we're supporting them in these decisions, but we're not making them for them. All right, that's good advice. We need to take a short break. There's more when we return. Now people have to stay at home and they can't avoid the clutter. So for some people, they all of a sudden realized how much was in their home that they didn't realize was there before because they just leave. The value of China, I would say, is maybe 25% of what it was. When I first started, you could take your collection and bring it to a shop and they would sell it and everybody would make some money. And now you can't even get an antique shop to take your china. The very first thing I try to get people to do if they have a china collection and nobody wants it is to take it out, put it in your kitchen cupboards and use it every single day. And not worry about whether you break a piece or if the silver rim gets worn off in the dishwasher. Welcome back. When you spend the majority of time outside of your home, at work, at restaurants, it isn't so difficult to keep it looking picture perfect, or perhaps you don't notice the imperfections as much. But with COVID forcing us to spend more time indoors, it's likely that pandemic clutter will have accumulated. So Julie, let me start with you. How has the pandemic affected our relationship with clutter? Well, you're absolutely right in saying now people have to stay at home and they can't avoid the clutter. So for some people, they all of a sudden realized how much was in their home that they didn't realize was there before because they just leave. And they felt better leaving than staying. So their relationship during the pandemic is sometimes they feel overwhelmed, their house feels out of control, and so they feel out of control. Um, sometimes it's a matter of that they have the skills and they see the clutter and they just organize it and they donate things and generally speaking put them in their garage or something until the stores open again but other people don't have those skills mm -hmm. and so they get overwhelmed by having all this stuff around and that stress and anxiety will then affect relationships with other people 
because there's just um, no feeling of having control and wanting your home to be the home that you love and enjoy. Mm -hmm. It's a vicious cycle. You know, Jane, on the one hand, at the beginning of the pandemic, we saw the effect of people wanting to stockpile, to load up on all kinds of toilet paper and paper towels and what have you, food. Um, and then on the other hand, people living at home, they are looking around and realizing, I need this space to be more functional. I can't continue to view it as a storage facility. And so, you know, in your experience, working with your clients, what have you seen? What has that relationship been like between them, the pandemic, and of course, clutter? Yeah, I mean, to, to your point and to Julie's point, um, certainly because everyone's on top of each other and they're at home, um, any uh, disagreements that they may have had about the state of their environment have uh, certainly come to the forefront. And um, what I'm also finding as part of my business is that people are realizing all of the unfinished renovation design projects that they meant to get to, um, but they now are realizing that they couldn't do them anyway because they have too much stuff in their house. And I think they're even more overwhelmed at the prospect of tackling any of that. You're so right. Uh, Sushi, you know, <laughs> hi, little babies. <laughs> Great to see you. <laughs> I love when kids make an appearance, especially during COVID. It's amazing. Um, yeah, I was going to add, you know, with, uh, with, uh, we have seen adult children move in. And that's never happened before. You know, if these kids um, of mine, where they were uh, 10, 15, 20, 30 year old kids have moved in with their parents and that creates a tremendous stress as well. So all of a sudden you find you need more space. And we have sold almost a, a hundred thousand items last month. And that's because of the need for people to declutter and create more room. You know, Catherine, how common is it for people to convert their homes, rooms, into storage rooms. So I'll give you an example in my own house. Um, I was looking at it this morning. My laundry room is just, it's full of toilet paper and paper towels and things that you typically stock up on. But I have no really other place to put it, but into a space that isn't, isn't meant to be a storage room, obviously. So how common is that for people? Well, I think it's common. It's not, it's not ideal and it's not by choice. People have a finite percentage of space and, and they're trying to optimize that and use it in whatever way they possibly can. So I don't think anyone goes into it. Um, but, I, but if I may, I just want to add one other thought to the impact of the pandemic on decluttering. And the biggest thing that we see as a downsizing company is that the doors to donation centers have slammed shut. And that has impacted every single downsizing project that we do. Because a typical downsizing project might see 70 or 80% of the goods in the house going to select donation sites. When those doors shut, that avenue shuts down. And so a lot of the people that we deal with simply get stuck where they are because they can't figure out now what to do with all those things. And there are solutions to what to do with those things, but it requires some creative problem solving. And, and sometimes an online auction is a good option, well, a good option. Well, and I was going to ask, I mean, you could turn to a Mac sold, but the you know, what is the solution there when you have nowhere to turn? Would it be to throw, to toss it into the garbage or what are people doing? Well, I'm going to say that unfortunately we've made more trips to the waste transfer station than I ever want to have to do again. And that's because generally we're working on a timeline where time is not our friend and things just have to go somewhere. And sometimes the, the fastest solution is the only solution that's available to us, which means that more things than should end up going to the waste transfer station. And it's a shame in so many other ways. But we do try to find other solutions. And one of them actually is to sell products. And because we can't do things in person and, and auctioneers and consignment stores can't do things in person anymore, the online auction becomes a very viable um, avenue. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I just want to end on, Julie, I'm, I'm curious because when I was thinking about this show and the issue of clutter, I wondered if in some ways it was a modern problem. And I say that because we live now in a world where we can go on Amazon or any one website and have something delivered to our door within a matter of hours. And, um, you know, are people, does it just make it easier for people to accumulate stuff? And has that created a bigger problem for us today? 
Absolutely. And the other reason I think that it's a modern problem is that our houses are bigger. Before houses used to be much smaller holding a family of four and now they're giants. So there's more space. And some people really hate empty space. They need to fill space. And so then you get people buying things and it's so easy. The other thing is that they might be bored, so they're buying things. And there's this sort of thrill of something arriving at the door. And so they get to open a package, especially during the pandemic when there's nothing else to do. Mm -hmm. So, and, and we've also had this throwaway society. So things are only supposed to last a five years or less. And then you get a new one or they advertise and say, oh, you need a new one. It has all these better gadgets on it. And so people will buy the new one, but they don't do anything with the old one. Hmm. Um, when you could donate it, they don't donate it. It just gets thrown in a drawer. And so clutter builds up in um, electronics, books, um, clothing, all those kinds of things. There's more of the Zoomer when we return. So you declutter, then you organize, and then you purchase products. A lot of people feel they have to hang on to everything because it's the expectation of other people who come to their home that they've always done it that way and they've always gone over the top. And I like people to think about, especially when they're downsizing, what would happen if you didn't do that? I think people would still come to your home and they would still have an amazing time. There's a question sometimes I ask people, if you look at all of this, what would your life be like if you didn't have all of this? It would be just fine. Ah. It, no, it would. Welcome back. We've all heard about spring cleaning, but what about spring clearing? Julie Stoby is the owner of Mind Over Clutter and says we should all be rethinking the way we tackle the mess in our homes. Julie, first of all, what's the difference between spring cleaning and spring clearing? Okay, spring cleaning is what we for sure needed to do in the past when windows were open and dirt was flying and way back when we had dirt floors and things had to be cleaned. But now we have air purification systems and windows are shut and air conditioners are in and houses get a lot less dirty. So we don't need to do an overhaul of cleaning every season. But spring clearing involves certainly decluttering and clearing possessions that you no longer need or use or want. But it also involves clearing out your schedule and activities that change with each season and also to look at the commitments that you have because some of them may not be your passion anymore. And so if you look at them, you might change the commitments you have. And so all of these things help to clear out your life. Now, I know you have a couple hacks for our audience, hacks, if you will, for our audience, um, for things to do that can help them sort of organize around the house. Uh, show us the first one. This is my favorite one because it's so inexpensive. It is a simple magazine holder. And the, the reason I like this is because you can use it for so many things other than magazines, but don't forget to use it for that. So you might not have enough drawers in your kitchen whoops, to hold all your paper supplies. Oh. So you can use one of these. That's clever. That is clever. In your cupboard. And then you can put it on a shelf. You're not looking for a drawer. They stay standing up. The nice thing about these, these um, magazine holders are most people think you have to use them vertically. Well, you don't. So maybe you want to pile things this way. And maybe your shelf is only this tall. Mm -hmm. So you can use them this way. And the nice thing about if you want to use the cardboard ones is that you can cut it to fit your shelf. Because a lot of times they're too tall. But they're also really nice for things like paper. So instead of stacking your paper so that you can't get out the color you want that's on the bottom, you can now stand it up, easily take out the one you want, put it back, and they all stay in order. The one thing I do want to tell you about magazine holders, they come in tons of colors, paper, plastic, all kinds of things. Try to avoid the ones with holes in the sides, because every time you stick something in, they come out and then you just get totally frustrated. 
You might end up pitching it if that was the case. Yeah, you might. All right, I like that idea, and it doesn't really cost very much. Exactly, and it's easy to get, easy to purchase, put together. When you're done with them, you can flatten them and recycle them. Well, and I was gonna ask, because, you know, it, it, when you begin your the process of tidying and, and getting organized, do you advise clients to go out and buy products that help you organize, bins, magazine holders, or is that just bringing more clutter into your house? So you declutter, then you organize, and then you purchase products. The, a lot of people find the fun part of organizing is buying the products, <laughs> and then they're the wrong size, they're the wrong shape, they don't fit in the cupboard, and they just created them more clutter for themselves. Right, right. So buying the products is last, because then you'll know exactly what you need, where it will be stored, the size of the bin, the type of thing that you want to use to store whatever you're storing. I like it. All right, what's the next hack? Okay, the next one is your basic cleaning caddy, which you probably use for cleaning supplies, mm -hmm. but don't limit yourself to that. This one, I put in all these exercise bands that like to expand and be hard to store. So you can make a caddy that's all your exercise equipment. And this is my favorite one for all of you parents that are at home with kids. This is a cleaning caddy. It has all these containers with markers, pens, bingo dabbers, all those things. And you can pull out a separate container. So you can put this on the table. Many children can share it all at once, take out the container that they need, use the markers, put it back, stick this caddy in whatever cupboard or shelf, and the table's cleaned up and ready for supper. Um, all right, well, Jane, any other tips that you give to your, to your customers, to your clients? Um, I mean, a lot of people know that I am a uh, practicing minimalist. So one of my major tips, and people will, will see this in the TV show as well, is once you've gone through and decluttered, do it again. Be brutal the second time around. And hopefully um, to a point that was raised earlier, your decision-making muscles are well warmed up and you'll be able to let go of even more. Because of course, the more you let go of, the less time you have to spend organizing. Hmm. All right, we need to take a short break. There's more on the other side, don't go away. Here's your chance to downsize your life and start living better. Back by popular demand is season two of The Big Downsize on Vision TV, and watching it has been really giving me some spring cleaning inspiration during my self-isolation. So I thought this would be the perfect time to call the decluttering queen herself and host of the program, Jane Beldoven, to help me minimize my clutter. I've been doing this for 15 years, right? So not much scares me anymore. No. And what better place to tackle next than the dreaded bedroom closet? Oh boy. Ah! Hey Jane, how are you? I'm doing great, Sean. What, what, what do I see behind you? An utter mess in my closet and I need help. It looks like you do and I, nothing I haven't seen before, Sean, so we're all good. This is a touch embarrassing, you know, I'm, I'm letting you into my world right now, right? What I would really like us to do is to focus on clearing the floor first. It's amazing that will make the space feel more organized very quickly and that will keep you going through to the end. Uh, what can I say? This is an old guitar my grandmother gave me who has now passed away, but um, I don't really play it anymore. So many times over the years I have uh, talked to people about sentimental attachment to items that have been passed down to you. Would your grandmother have wanted the guitar to be sitting in the closet covered in dust or would you have preferred someone to be playing the guitar and using it? I mean, I would go with the latter. Yeah, and you know, maybe take it out of the case, take a picture of it so that you have the memory that you had the guitar and then um, pass it along to someone else who would use it. Let's pull the shoes out. Some of them look dusty, Sean. Ooh. Oh my, yeah. Goodness. Most of us wear 20% of what's in our closet 80% of the time. If you have 10 or 12 or whatever you have there, you're still gonna wear three pair of shoes. The, the last thing here, I pulled this out. My mother oh. gave me a bunch of like spare duvets and sheets. The bed linen thing was a big thing and big downsize season two this year because this is something that everyone struggles with. 
I know that the community center I mentioned in my neighborhood is actually looking for specifically for bed linens. Okay. So it would be a really good time for you to check around. Now comes the uh, pied de resistance. Are there any things that you see there that you can say, you know what, I have not worn that in a year? Yeah, yeah, 100%. Start from one side, take them out, and hopefully those will be a little easier to get rid of. I'm quite happy with what I'm seeing there. Your closet is not stuffed completely full. Now you need to take all of those items that you've taken out of there and put them somewhere in the middle of the floor where you're not going to forget that you have to ah. contact people and say, hey, who wants this? Give them a watch, put them in the bag or box, mark them donate, let them sit for two or three days, and then you're ready to go drop them off. So I guess you're wondering, did I actually clean up my mess or did I just put it back into the closet after I was done my call with Jane? The truth is, I'm actually going to give my clothes to a good friend of mine. Now it's time to put a smile on his face. If you still need inspiration with your spring cleaning, check out season two of The Big Downsize on Vision TV. Too many people get involved in the decision making process. <laughs> From our experience, we like to work with a client one on one because the moment you bring a second person to that, you bring a second opinion and everything stalls. It's a big, beautiful house, but it doesn't look as big because we've got stuff everywhere. Go back to a smaller house, everything in here is just not gonna fit. Moving is stressful. I'm stressed about it. What am I gonna do with all my stuff? Two households, with the help of one organizing expert, find their way out from under an avalanche of stuff and together tackle the big downsize. Welcome back. That was a clip from the brand new season of The Big Downsize, starring Jane Feldhoven on Vision TV. This season, Jane follows two separate households as they try to downsize their digs and clear away the clutter. Jane, first of all, congratulations on another season. And, Thank you. And uh, tell us what we have to expect coming up. Well, I can't give away too much because we've only had uh, one episode uh, so far, uh, which is just sort of introducing everyone to the two families. Um, I have to say this year, I think there was a lot more struggle on the part of both households in different ways with the concept of downsizing. So we got into doing a bit of decluttering and making a plan. And then it was almost like in the middle, they, they went, whoa, wait a minute, we're doing what? <laughs> I had, <laughs> like, they didn't really think about the process and the results and the big life change until we got into the process of dealing with their stuff. Why do you think that is? Was it because of the pandemic or it's, you know, what, what do you think the reason is for that? Yeah, I, I don't think it was pandemic related. Um, when, when people downsize, they all do it for um, completely different reasons. And in, in past seasons, like season two, both families were, I'm ready, I'm doing this, I'm excited, I can't wait to get rid of my stuff and get into my new smaller space. But I, I think this year, um, you know, both households sort of went into it with a, a little more trepidation. And I mean, you could be right, it might be related to the pandemic because there's been so much change in our lives to add that huge change on top of everything else. What would you say are the most common mistakes people make when tackling their clutter? Oh, uh, th there's a lengthy list, I'm sure. Um, the, the biggest thing that I see, and I'm sure my colleagues will agree with this, is you start decluttering one spot and then you go to the other side of your house and start decluttering another spot and then you decide it might be the time to pull apart a closet and you end up with a whole bunch of little projects started and nothing finished. Uh, Catherine, would you agree with that? Well, I would agree with that. And I would add another challenge is that too many people get involved in the decision-making process. <laughs> From our experience, we like to work with a client one-on-one -on -one because the moment you bring a second person to that, you bring a second opinion and everything stalls. So then, Julie, what's the first thing you tell your clients when they're looking to downsize, declutter, organize? Well, I ask them what their goals are so that we're both on the same page. And, they, and then a clear plan can be set. 
And once they know what that plan is, it's much easier to decide what they're keeping, what they're letting go of, and move forward with their downsizing and decluttering. But sometimes you make a plan and it's, it's tough to stick to it, is it not? Oh, absolutely, because then you start seeing things that you want to keep that don't fit into your plan. And that's why the plan is probably the most important part is because you can use it as a guideline. You can keep reminding yourself what that goal is at the end, whether it's a complete downsize of a house or whether it's just for a, one room, but it helps you to stay on task. Sushi, in your experience, what would be the rooms that most commonly need some order to them? Well, this is when we bring in an organizer or a professional move manager, like you know, like uh, like the folks, the professionals around the room, and and it's um, it's usually the the rooms that are least, you know, where people spend the least amount of time in, which, as alluded you alluded to before, that people tend to use as a storage room. Uh, so whether it's a spare bedroom or whether that's a basement or even the the formal living room that people don't use. That's where people tend to accumulate things, especially in the pandemic when you're not having visitors over. So what we do, one big tip that we that we usually apply is we we give them a hard date on when everything is going to leave, and then we work backward. So that really creates a forcing function on getting things ready, getting list, getting things online, and there's a firm date on when people are going to come to remove the items. You know, we do that in a pandemic, COVID-friendly, safe way. Um, and that's that's possibly one of the biggest tips that I can give is a firm date and then work backward with a contract on hand, parachuting in and a professional to help. Jane, same question. I mean, what where do you spend most of your time when helping a family typically? I mean, what's the area of the house that really typically needs most most work? Um, I, see, I find it's the areas that people live in every day. K kitchens are huge. Yeah. I, I can't count how many hundreds of them I've done over the 18 years that I've been doing this. And uh, I mean, in the big downsize, it seems every single family, every season, we're doing clothes <laughs> and shoes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> I think my closet could use some work. That's probably <laughs> probably the case. All right. You can tune into the brand new season of The Big Downsize on Vision TV. You can also catch episodes online at visiontv.ca. There's more up to the break. But first, here's another look at the new season of The Big Downsize. This is our dining room, a.k.a. storage. We even okay. have an old TV here. Aww. It's not that old, but it's yeah. it's got a little bit of an issue with it. Yes, yeah, it's one of those smart TVs, so yeah. it's it's very nice. It's but you, and you can't bear to let go of it because you might be able to fix it. Is that? I mean, well, we only so. have four other big TVs in this house. One of the reasons we moved is I want to get a big screen TV, and and my wife said, "Got to get a bigger host first. So I said, "Well, let's let's get a bigger host." When I'm working with older clients that are downsizing, I want them to pick the things that have meaning to them and bring joy to their life that they want to take with them to the next spot. Ideally, I would like to suggest that you start purging your home at least a year before you plan to move. Oh my God. Okay, here's There's a lot packed green. in that small cover. When you said linens, you meant it. Oh my goodness. Wow. And I know a year ahead of time seems so far in advance, but what I love to see is that you have a chance to go through every cupboard, every closet, the garage, the shed, the basement, and touch every single thing that you own so that when it comes time to move, you only have what you want to take with you. Welcome back. Every year, more and more Zoomers are faced with the challenge, downsize and reap the profit, or age in place. But preparing to live in a smaller space brings up a challenge, how to get rid of all the stuff you've accumulated through the years. Now, Sushi, I love the concept of Max Sold for our audience. Tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, your business model. Yeah, so we make it really easy to sell everything in one go. We sell everything from wall to wall, floor to ceiling, soup to nuts. <laughs> the way I describe the business <laughs> is that we sell everything from the sponge under the sink 
to the Ferrari in the driveway. <laughs> and not too many Ferraris on Maxwell, but there's lots of Lincolns and Oldsmobiles. But we do sell a lot of sponges under the sink. It's all, we, we get it all out in one go uh, through a three-step rigorous process. Literally sponges under the sink or? Absolutely. Come on. You know, the, you know to validate this, I checked on an auction that just recently closed. Uh, $2 cleaning supplies under the sink. It all, it all, it all has value. It all goes. So, so how does it work? You go into a home and do you look at all of the various items and you take everything that isn't wanted or do you pick through the items that you think hold value and discard the ones that don't? Yeah, we, uh, we don't uh, judge or cherry pick. We go into photograph, catalog, measure and describe every single thing that needs to go. Uh, so, and then it gets listed online and then we put it to an e-commerce platform or maxsold.com and then uh, things get uh, marketed and sold within that one week period. And sold all together or sold piecemeal? A uh, piecemeal, yeah. Okay. So you can bid Different on the buyers. sponge of the cleaning yeah. supplies, you can bid on the Ferrari in the driveway. <laughs> so <laughs> they all sell to the highest bidder regardless of price and everything starts at a dollar. So that creates a lot of competition and interest in the items. And the things that don't have much value, you know, they sell for a dollar or two. And things like mid-century modern, that's all the rage these days, those sell for like thousands of dollars. You know, Catherine, I know you work closely with sushi or at least have in the past. How valuable has this service been to, you, to your clients, to your customers? Well, it's always been valuable, but during the pandemic, it's become invaluable mm -hmm. because as I mentioned earlier, when donation sites close, we lose one of our main sources of redistribution. And so then the challenge is, how do you get those things out of the house? And selling is always a good option. And if online auctions are the only option available to us, then that's where we go. And we have used Maxold a, a number of times over the years since I've been running the company and they were a good partner before, they're a better partner now. Um, and uh, I, I don't wanna make this a sales endorsement for them, but it is a very good solution because they've got a very systematic approach. It's very transparent for you know, the client and, um, and the buyer. And so, so and, and so I, it's, it's something worth looking at. You know, Julie, uh, you know, when you work with your clients, how do you help them identify what holds value and what doesn't? Well, a lot of times what holds value, we're not talking dollar figures. So it's what's important to them. So sometimes with older people, you will find that it's the older items that hold value to them. And it might be a cognitive issue. Those are the things they remember. So it's not always the new things and the things that other family members would say, this is an expensive item. It has value, you should take it. So there's this um, balance between value meaning it's important to them and value meaning something that has a lot of money. So when I'm working with older clients that are downsizing, I want them to pick the things that have meaning to them and bring joy to their life that they want to take with them to the next spot. And if it's something of great dollar value, that's where Max Hold comes in. <laughs> and Jane, you know, I've heard of one multi-million dollar sale of a home hinging on whether or not the old tattered couch fit inside of it, right? And it's, you know, how often does that happen? Is that common for people to just not let go? Yeah, I would have to say so. And um, often some unrealistic expectations as to what will fit in their new smaller space, mm -hmm. uh, which we definitely uh, dealt with in season two of The Big Downsize. All right, Catherine, last question to you. Again, it's, it's that sentimental clutter. How do we deal with it? Well, we try to distill the sentiment and really hype up the logic, which means that we start with a very factual discussion about what will actually fit in the new place. And we go through a process where we do a floor plan and a furniture plan in order to prove what will actually fit. So that we're making decisions with logic and trying to take the emotion out of it. And we don't disrespect the emotion. We understand that it's an important part of the decision-making, but our objective is always to get them to a new place in a safe and efficient fashion. And so 
there's a process that we go through and, and, and usually not always, but usually the logic wins. All right. Well, when we come back, we'll hear final thoughts from our panelists. Welcome back. With only a few minutes left, our panelists will leave you with some of their final thoughts, starting with Sushi. Yeah, COVID-19 has made a lot of things challenging, but decluttering, downsizing doesn't have to be one of them. You know, in this show, you're surrounded by professionals. Reach out to us at maxwell.com or any one of these move, moving and downsizing professionals, and it's easy. We make it happen fast. <laughs> Jane. Uh, one of the main things that I always encourage my clients to think about is the fact that the possessions that they have accumulated over the years and that they hold in their space all have energy. If they're able to let go of the possessions, it shifts the energy and makes the transition process much easier for them. Hmm. Julie. Going with what Jane said, there's possessions that you have that are not meant to stay with you all of your life. They're meant to move through your life. So I always encourage people to let go of those things that they no longer need, love, and use and let somebody else use them before they come to the state where they're too old, they're too dirty, and they just end up in landfill. And Catherine. My final thought would be that Downsizing is the solution. It's not the challenge. A lot of people get stuck because they see only the challenge. They don't see the solution that lies beyond it. And so we encourage them to think in about what the final solution looks like and understand and have the confidence they can get there. And there's lots of people on this panel and people beyond that can help them get there. I love that. It's the solution, not the challenge. I love that. All right. That's all the time we have. Thank you to my panelists for being here and to you at home for watching. We'll see you soon. For now, it's time to zoom out.